I propose to speak for about a half an hour on the Labour Party and the British alternative in the hope of provoking a useful discussion. Suppose I defend alternatives distant from the present arrangements. You may say they are interesting but utopian. Suppose I then propose policies close to what now exists. You are likely to respond. They are feasible but trivial. In the present climate of thought around the world, almost everything that can be proposed by way of an alternative will appear to be either utopian or trivial. And thus our programmatic thinking is paralyzed. This false dilemma results from a misunderstanding of the nature of programmatic arguments. They are not about blueprints. They are about successions. They are not architecture. They are music. This false dilemma besetting programmatic argument is today aggravated by another intellectual confusion. We have lost faith in any of the large available understandings of how structural change takes place in history. And as a result, we fall back on a bastardized conception of political realism. Namely, that a proposal is realistic to the extent that it approaches what already exists. And this false view of political realism then aggravates the paralysis of our programmatic ideas. It is in this spirit that I intend now to speak. The two most important attributes of a programmatic proposal are first, that it mark a direction, and second, that it indicate in a particular circumstance the first steps by which to begin to move in that direction. I divide my remarks into four steps. First, I describe a wrong direction a direction that we should resist because it squanders the opportunity for structural change. Second, in the heart of my remarks today, I outline four elements of an alternative direction that would give substance to the structural imperative. Third, I propose three ways of thinking about the ultimate aspiration in forming this alternative. And fourth, at the end, I consider the obstacles and opportunities that arise from the British circumstance. The wrong direction, the inadequate direction is the combination of vulgar Keynesianism with responsible capitalism. A few words about each of the elements of this misdirection. Vulgar Keynesianism, the belief that the left, that the progressives, especially in the aftermath of an economic slump, should stand above all for stimulus, for the promotion of demand. Now, the truth is that no major economic slump can ever be overcome 
by a demand-led recovery promoted by the government. The rise in demand would have to be massive and to be effective combined with institutional changes as it was in the war economies of the mid-20th century. Long before the demand policy reached the adequate level, it would be resisted and stopped. And it would provoke a crisis of confidence, especially in the sovereign debt. Now, that is not a reason to abandon uh, stimulus. So long as we understand the proper and accessory role of stimulus in the creation of an alternative. The role is to prevent the worsening of a crisis, to play for time, and to prefigure in the design of the stimulus the structural alternative to be defended. The stimulus is not a surrogate for the alternative. The stimulus is, at best, the first step. Vulgar Keynesianism is often combined with the project of responsible capitalism. Now, what does it mean, responsible capitalism? I suggest two interpretations a minimalist interpretation and a maximalist interpretation. The minimalist interpretation says we need a form of capitalism that leads big business to emphasize the long term over the short term, that induces big business to take account of the effects of its activity on the creation or destruction of public goods, and that recognizes a multiplicity of stakeholders other than simply the shareholders in private business. Now, the chief objection to this minimalist form of responsible capitalism is not even that it fails to implement a structural change, it is that it is superfluous. Responsible capitalism understood in this minimalist way is something that will happen anyway. Without any political project, because it corresponds to the interests of big business properly understood. It doesn't need a political party or a government to promote it. What then would the maximalist version of responsible capitalism be? The maximalist version would be a transformation of the institutional model of the market economy in some direction. But in what direction? The only tangible example that we have of a maximalist version of responsible capitalism is the corporatist communitarianism of the period between the two great wars of the last century, with its long corporatist aftermath in contemporary Europe, and with a few left-wing alternatives, such as Gill socialism. If the minimalist version of responsible capitalism is superfluous, the maximalist version is undesirable. It cannot be formulated today in a way that makes it appealing or pertinent to the solution of the contemporary problems. The temptation of the progressives in Britain today is, fall, is to fall back by default for lack of a stronger alternative on this weak combination 
of vulgar Keynesianism and responsible capitalism in its minimalist version. So I now come to the alternative. And the keynote of the alternative is a disposition to challenge and to change the institutional arrangements that define the market economy, democratic politics, and an independent civil society. The traditional form of ideological conflict in the world, the state against the market, more state, less market, more market, less state, a synthesis of market or state is dead or dying and is in the process of being replaced by another contest among the alternative institutional forms of economic, political, and social pluralism. The first major line of a structural alternative in Britain today is the effort to democratize the market economy, not simply to regulate it, not simply to compensate for the inequalities that it generates by appealing to retrospective and compensatory tax and transfer, but to change it in its institutional content and its legal expression. Now, this first major line of the alternative, I in turn propose to divide into four main aspects. The first aspect, let me call vanguardism outside the vanguard. We now see in all the major economies of the world the emergence of a new style of production sometimes described as post-Fordist, and characterized by an attenuation of the contrast between conception and execution, by a fluid mixture of cooperation and competition, and by the transformation of productive activity into a practice of permanent innovation, with the result that the best firms come to resemble the best schools. The problem is that this economic vanguardism remains in all the major economies of the world largely confined to advanced sectors weakly linked to all other parts of each national economy. And the vast majority of the labor force remains excluded from these advanced fronts of economic activity. The task then is to disseminate the advanced practices through large sectors of the economy and the society. And it is that task that I am calling vanguardism outside the vanguard. The chief addressees of this effort are the small and medium-sized firms responsible for the larger part of output and the vast majority of jobs. The method is not subsidy, but the expansion of access to credit, technology, knowledge, and advanced practice. And the institutional horizon is the creation of a new institutional framework of relations between government and business and of relations among firms. In the relations between government and business, there are now two main models available in the world. The American model of arm's length regulation of business by government and the Northeast Asian model of imposition of unitary trade and industrial policy by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. What is required for the sake of vanguardism outside the vanguard is a form of strategic coordination that is decentralized, pluralistic, participatory, 
and experimental. Its complement in the relations among firms would be the promotion of regimes of cooperative competition, allowing small and medium-sized businesses to cooperate, achieving economies of scale, while they continue to compete against one another. The second main line of this effort to democratize the market economy is the reshaping of the relation between finance and the real economy. In all the principal economies of the world, production continues to be largely self-financed on the basis of the retained and reinvested earnings of private firms. What then is the purpose of all of that money in the banks and the stock markets? Theoretically, to finance the productive agenda of society, in fact, very little of it has more than an episodic or oblique relation to productive activity. Finance, as a result, is largely indifferent to the real economy in good times and destructive in bad times. Instead of being a good servant, it becomes a bad master. A series of changes, then, must be promoted that enlist finance in the service of the real economy. Tax and regulatory changes that discourage financial activity that has no plausible relation to the expansion of output or the enhancement of productivity, and that encourages the forms of finance that do have such a relation, and the enlistment of the powers of the state to promote activities that mimic private venture capital through decentralized and intermediate bodies under professional management and competitive pressure. The third major aspect of the effort to democratize the market economy, to democratize it, not just to regulate it, is to impose an upward tilt to the returns to labor. Now, support for a rise in the nominal wage is at best an accessory element in such a program. It can be effective only if combined with the initiatives that enhance productivity, especially the vanguardism outside the vanguard that I just described, and the changes in education to which I shall speak soon. But aside from productivity and education, there is a third element much less familiar and no less important. If this upward tilt to the returns to labor is to be achieved, this third element is the reshaping of the legal framework of the relations between capital and labor. Throughout much of the world, the returns to labor are now diminishing. And the fundamental reason is the reorganization of production on a worldwide scale. What we think of as the natural form of the organization and defense of labor is almost entirely dependent on the historical model of mass production, a large stable workforce assembled in large productive units under the aegis of large corporate entities. And this form of the organization of labor remained prevalent and uncontested only in the long period from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th. 
Before then, labor, including labor and manufacturing, was largely organized on the basis of decentralized networks of contractual relations. And there is much to indicate that that is how labor will again be organized. And that the form that we think of as natural will appear in retrospect as a relatively brief interlude between the two long historical periods in which labor was organized in the form of decentralized contractual systems. Flexibility then comes to mean universal insecurity. The fundamental question therefore posed to the progressives and to the labor parties around the world and in Britain is how this reality is to be mastered so that the new putting out system does not turn into the subversion of the rights of labor and the diminishment of the returns to labor. A new legal regime complementing the existing regime to protect, to organize, and to represent labor in the new circumstance. The fourth aspect of the effort to democratize the market economy in Britain has to do with the implications of these commitments for the relation of Britain to Europe and to the world economy. The hidden generative principle of the European Union is that the rules and policies governing the organization of economic life are increasingly centralized in the government of the Union while the educational and social endowments of the citizens are delegated to the local authorities. Now for the progressives and for the Democrats, the vocation of the union should be exactly the opposite of this one. The central responsibility of the union should be to defend the capabilities and the endowments of all of its citizens, but then to create the greatest possible space for institutional divergence in each of the member countries. Britain under labor should therefore engage with the union less to exact favors for the city than to ally itself with the southern and eastern member states in an effort radically to change the direction of the Union against the sometime inclination of the Central European powers. There is a similar consequence for the relation of Britain to the world economy. The world trading system under the aegis of the WTO treaties is being organized in the form of an institutional maximalism, requiring the members, the trading countries, to adhere not simply to the market economy, but to a very particular version of the market economy. A version that, for example, outlaws under the label subsidies all the forms of strategic coordination between business and government that the countries now rich used in order to become rich and that they must use again to change themselves. The interest of Britain as a free trading country is to defend an institutional maximal minimalism such as existed under the regime prior to the WTO, the regime of the GATT. The maximum economic openness with the minimum of restraint 
on the institutional experiments that are required to reinvent the market economy. It is not in the interest of a free trading state to require the enemies of the imposition of a particular version of the market economy to become enemies of free trade itself. Now, all of this is by way of expounding what I have called the first direction, the direction of democratizing the market economy. The second direction is the direction of a change in the character of education. The place to begin is the place that is rarely mentioned, the content. The retrograde national curriculum in conformity to the prevailing international tests must be swept aside in favor of another form of education, a form that emphasizes analytic capability rather than information, that rejects the encyclopedia using information selectively to develop analytical capability, that promotes cooperation in teaching and learning at every stage against the combination of individualism and authoritarianism in the classroom, and that insists in a dialectical approach to the received body of knowledge, teaching every discipline from at least two contrasting points of view. The best place to begin in such an educational alternative is the moment before the university, the middle school, insisting on a spectrum that combines general and vocational training, a form of general education that is analytical rather than encyclopedic and informational, and a form of practical education that accords priority to generic conceptual and practical capabilities rather than to job-specific and machine-specific skills. In such a transformation, the state must have a central role, the role of moving the guideposts, of resisting the pressure of the international tests and comparisons, focused as they are on the wrong targets, in forming a group of teachers able to teach in this spirit, and of establishing schools, state schools, that exceed all of the existing private schools in their ability to exemplify this new way of teaching and of learning. And then, and only then, on that basis, giving the widest latitude to the local educational authorities. It is in that framework that it becomes possible to combine the local management of the schools with national standards of investment and quality. The third major direction of this democratizing productivism that I here defend is an association of the state with independent civil society in the provision of public goods. What we now have in Britain and in the world by way of the provision of public goods is what you might describe as an administrative Fordism, the provision of standardized, low-quality public goods by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. And when I say low-quality, I mean of lower quality than the equivalent goods 
that can be bought on the market by people who have money. The only alternative to this administrative Fordism appears to be the privatization of public services in favor of profit-driven firms. There is, however, another option that will become increasingly important in the course of the 21st century. The state must ensure the floor, a universal minimum of public services for everyone. And the state must operate at the ceiling in the development of the costliest, most complicated, and most advanced public services. But in the broad area between the floor and the ceiling, the state should form a partnership with independent civil society to engage civil society, to equip it, to finance it, and to monitor it so that it participate cooperatively in the experimental and competitive provision of public services. That is at once the best way to enhance the quality of public services and the best provocation to the independent organization of civil society outside the state. The fourth line of this alternative that I propose is the deepening of British democracy. The relative and flawed democracies that now exist around the world are incapable of mastering and changing the structure of society. By their flaws, they renew the power of the dead over the living, and they make change depend on crisis. The fundamental rhythm of European life in the 20th century is that transformation depended on war and economic ruin, and that with prosperity came sleep. What is needed is a form of democracy that does not require trauma to make transformation possible. How is it to happen? By a simultaneous energizing of democracy from the bottom up and from the top down. From the bottom up, through the two devices that I have previously described, vanguardism outside the vanguard, and the association of the state with civil society in the provision of public goods. But aside from these two sets of innovations, there is a third element already at hand that has the immense potential to promote this energizing of British democracy from the bottom up, devolution. Now, what can devolution become? And what is its meaning for democracy? It has two possible outcomes. On one side, devolution can be devolution as separation, as withdrawal, as disconnection. And this kind of devolution finds an absolute limit in the scale required for the provision of public goods. But on the other hand, devolution can also mean a new way in which the localities can connect with the center. Devolution may not have to be the opposite of a strong central direction. A unitary state without ceasing to be unitary can engage with local governments that promote counter models of the national future. And this combination of the two extremes 
of the unitary state with the energized localities may in fact prove to be superior in the fecundity of its experiments to a conventional federal regime with its rigid allotment of powers among the three levels of a federation. The significance of this contrast between devolution as disconnection and devolution as counter model will become manifest as soon as the Scottish question turns into the English one. The energizing of British democracy must take place simultaneously from the top down. And here, by way of introduction to this idea, is a theoretical remark. Under a presidential regime, such as the Constitution of the United States, the liberal principle of the fragmentation of power is associated by design and intention with the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. And the Americans believe mistakenly that these two principles are indissolubly connected. Now we have a similar arrangement in the semi-presidential regimes, such as the Constitution of the Fifth French Republic, where there is a fast time, the parliamentary majority coinciding with the president, and a slow time when they diverge. A Democrat should desire a constitutional system in which there is no slow time, only a fast time. And it might seem in principle or in theory that a pure parliamentary regime such as the British could only have a fast time. But the truth is just the opposite. The fast time in the existing constitutional regimes is always the exception. The normal is the slow time. If the parliamentary majority is thin, if the parties are factionalized, if there is no conclusive debate in society, and if as a consequence of all of these circumstances, the major organized interests can impose their vetoes upon the state, there is no change. How can a constitutional regime and a style of politics be established that guarantee that there will be only a fast time? By a greater facility for anticipated elections, including national plebiscites and referenda of a comprehensive programmatic character by the ample public financing of political activity and not just electoral activity, by extended free access to the means of mass communication in favor of the political parties and the organized social movements, and in all these ways by a heating up of politics and an acceleration of its pace. An implication is a dramatic strengthening of the role and the constitutional status of the Electoral Commission. Although these proposals may strike an alien note to contemporary British ears, similar ideas were advanced in the past in Britain not only by constitutional radicals like Jeremy Bentham, but also by arbiters of constitutional orthodoxy like Arthur Dicey. The energizing of British democracy is to be the convergent outcome of these movements from the bottom up and from the top down. Now I come to the fourth and last step of my intervention. The relation of these proposals to the circumstances of Britain 
and of the Labour Party. Uh, now, a great British advantage is the combination of variety and of openness, openness to the world. And the problem is that openness threatens to become universal insecurity. The task then is the reinvention of openness so that it not translate into insecurity. Another British advantage is that Britain has in the combination of manufacturing and services many of the pre-Fordist conditions of a successful post-Fordism. A dense associational network and long-standing traditions of craft labor. The labor militancy must turn to the unorganized majority of society and not mean simply the defense of the historical prerogatives of the organized minority. The middle class social improvement must be made serious and consequential by acquiring an institutional agenda. And the nonconformist religion must take the associational background of society not simply as a presupposition but as a task. A task to be implemented in the service of the aim that nonconformist religion has always had, which is the lifting up of ordinary men and women to a greater life. Many will say that a program such as this one cannot be achieved because it offends too many powerful interests. They are mistaken, with the sole possible exception of cosmopolitan finance. There is no major interest in British society irreconcilable to a project such as this one. The chief obstacle lies less in the strength of the opposing interests than in the weakness of our abilities to combine circumstantial calculation with programmatic vision. Of all the resources that this project requires, the resource that it chiefly needs is the one that is always the scarcest, especially when lavished in the shadow of the next day's troubles. Imagination. Imagination. Imagination to the rescue. <laughs>